So spiders. All right. So spiders have been of interest to humans uh, since the dawn of time. So you can find depictions of spiders in practically every culture on the planet. And part of the attraction uh, to spiders has to do with their construction of webs. In fact, the name arachnid comes from Greek mythology um, from a character named Arachne, who is a, a woman who is claimed to have, uh, is a depiction of here, this wood engraving here, who uh, wove tapestries uh, more beautiful than the gods. And uh, in the end, uh, as in many Greek mythologies, she ends up dead. Uh, Athena feels bad about it. So she basically reincarnates her in the form of a spider. And she spends the rest of her life and her children's lives continually spinning uh, structures of beauty. And specifically, oftentimes, this structure is an orb web. So you can see even this wood engraving here. It's a specific type of web, the orb web, which is an example of um, animal architecture. And as we know, animal architecture isn't confined to just spiders. Many types of organisms build things. So here's an example of an Indian weaver bird, or um, this is a, a sand uh, uh, structure built at the bottom of the seafloor by male pufferfish. They make these to uh, attract females. This is a beaver dam. All of these are, are examples of animal architecture. And essentially, these structures are a record of behavior. So an algorithm, a se sequence of behaviors, had to be um, performed in a certain sequence in order to build these structures. So they're a physical record of behavior. And it's quite convenient if you do behavioral research like myself, because um, if you're not working with humans, you can't ask the animals, you know, why are you performing this behavior? But with animal architecture, they conveniently leave behind a physical record of their behavioral intent. And ultimately, these behavioral rules used to build these structures are encoded in the brain. What my lab is interested in knowing is how are behavioral rules, or ultimately structures like this, encoded in the brain? And I think for answering this type of question, spider webs are, have a variety of uh, advantages relative to these other structures. Um, they're very attractable. So many of these species are difficult to work with. You can't work with them in the lab. Um, and it's a fairly easily, easily defined structure. So many structures like a beaver dam or a, you know, the, a nest, they're very difficult to define geometrically or mathematically. But a spider web is conveniently two-dimensional and very easy to define uh, you know, features of the web, such as the number of radii, spiral spacing, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, it's an innate behavior. So you don't have to train spiders to build webs. They have an innate desire to build them. Um, and even though it's an innate behavior, it's not reflexive. So they're constantly performing error correction and error assessment. And it, since it's conveniently two-dimensional, that means if you're trying to define behaviors, most of the behaviors are confined to this two-dimensional plane, which makes recording the behavior with a single camera fairly easy. It's also built blindly. So many orb weavers build at night, but even orb weavers who build during the day, they still build blindly because the spider's eyes are located on sort of the ventral or backside of their head, but their legs are located on the ventral side. So it'd be like trying to build something by looking up into the air. So all of the building is based on uh, tactile senses. Um, and it's built, um, this behavior is performed multiple times in its lifetime. So you don't have to, uh, you know, it's, it's not like mating behaviors where they only perform it when they're mating. Spiders live on the web and they'll only eat live prey and that's found on the web. So if we take down the webs, the spiders will just build another web. So it's very easy to encourage them uh, to do this in the lab. So would, uh, my lab primarily uses uh, worms as a research model organism. Um, but uh, a few years ago, I got really interested in spiders. And so I started doing a lot of background research on spiders. And just as an aside, if you too are interested in learning more about spiders and spider webs, I highly recommend these three books. Um, this book on the right, Spider Webs by William Eberhard, recently came out this past year. It's excellent and I, can, I think it's the primary reference if you're interested in spider webs. It's a spider's web here on the left, I think is the canonical um, uh, you know, first book uh, published on, on this uh, 
on this phenomenon. So as I mentioned before, the picture I showed was of an orb web, a sort of spiral-like structure. Um, but those are only performed by a certain group of spiders. So um, these are um, a cladograms, or they basically treat trees of life are the relatedness of spiders. Um, these names and spiders should basically represent different you know, families of spiders. When it comes to orb weaving, this classic orb web structure, they're really only performed by this group here, the um, Aranidae. The, uh, the, these are your typical orb weavers that you find in your garden. And uh, these uh, spiders down here, the Euliboridae, and Danopidae, and uh, Acopidae. Other spiders either um, build different types of webs or like cobwebs or sheet webs. And many spiders, such as the megalomorphs up here, are, don't build uh, webs at all. So only a, a very you know, small subset of spiders build webs or uh, build orb webs. Of the spiders that, spiders that build orb webs, they all use the same behavioral paradigm to build them. So um, uh, these images here are uh, the position of the spider in time when it builds a web. These are taken by some of the Schelke in Switzerland. The top structure here is, is the is the coordinate position of um, a Eula board, and the one down here is um, an Aranid. These are separate by a few hundred million years of evolution, and yet they go through the same steps of building the orb web. First, they build a proto web, which is not part of the final structure. It's just sort of random mesh of, of web. They eventually take that down and they build the radii and frame in yellow, the auxiliary spiral in white, the sticky spiral in blue. This is the part that captures prey. And some build a stable momentum, which is a little decoration in the center. So what does this look like? So these are some videos of a spider building a web in our lab. This is sped up, sped up, sped up about 300 times, so they don't move this quickly. Um, and this spider is in the proto-web stage. And you can see this stage is very dynamic. It's laying down lines, it removes lines, it adjusts um, uh, the, the position of the lines. Um, they never build the same proto-web twice. It's thought that during this stage, what she's doing is she is a, assessing the structural integrity of the environment. She's trying to decide where are good anchor points for me to build a web. If you disturb a spider during this time where she falls or if something happens, she typically abandons web building. And it's thought she does this because out in the wild, if she falls during the stage, obviously this wasn't a very good place to build a web because a branch broke or something. And so she'll try to build somewhere else. As she progresses through this stage, um, she starts to build something that sort of looks like an orb web. And she transitions toward building a more radial-like structure. As she starts to take down the proto-web, she simultaneously starts building the frame and some radii. She fills in more frames. She spirals outward, that was building the auxiliary spiral. And then she spirals back inward with the sticky spiral. The sticky spiral, the silk is, uh, the composition of the silk is different. It has a sticky um, uh, quality to it. And she takes down the auxiliary spiral as she spirals back inward. It's not that the auxiliary spiral is kind of like scaffolding. It stabilizes the radii. So when she's building the capture spiral, it doesn't move too much. And then she sits in the, um, the center of the web and she's done and she waits for prey to head. All right. Wasn't that beautiful? I think they're such elegant organisms. So what I would like to know is, what are the behaviors involved in performing this at a higher spatial and temporal resolution and how is it encoded in the brain? One way we can try to get a handle on how this is encoded in the brain is by using drugs. So this is classic work by Peter Witt started, started in the forties. And then for a few decades, we gave a variety of different drugs of abuse to spiders and looked at how they changed the web. This is a table of a variety of different drugs that have been used. And um, uh, the colors here indicate parts of the web that were affected by the drugs. So it turns out the drugs change the structure of the web, but they don't change all the structures of the web and they don't change the web the same way. So for example, if you give a low dose of caffeine uh, to a spider, this is the normal web, when you give caffeine, the size of the web changes, but the regularity of the structure doesn't change too much. However, if you get methamphetamine, the size doesn't change appreciably, but the regularity of the capture spiral is significantly affected. This is interesting because 
these drugs, their targets are um, targeting chemical pathways in the brain that are known to affect internal states. What do I mean by internal states? So during your life, you go through a variety of different behavioral states, satiety, like hunger or arousal, emotions, motivation. These are all sort of states that you go through like long lasting and affect how you behave. And these drugs basically target chemical pathways in the brain that are known to affect these internal states. And the fact that these drugs target different parts of the um, web is one indication that perhaps these different stages of web building reflect different internal or arousal states the spider's going through. So when I went through and read all these things, I thought it was incredibly fascinating and I wondered why, why, aren't, why aren't more people trying to investigate how the web is encoded in the brain? And I quickly found out that it's because spiders are not easy to work with. So many of the organisms that are used in labs, such as mice and flies and worms and bacteria and all these things, these are all organisms of, of human refuse, right? They're very easy to raise in the lab because in our normal everyday lives, they're difficult for us to just get rid of. Many of us struggle to prevent these things from living around us. So that makes them very easy to raise in the lab. Most organisms don't wanna be in the lab, so it makes it challenging, and spiders are no different. Also, they're venomous, um, they're notoriously cannibalistic. The venom glands, many of them lie on top of the brain, which makes access to the brain difficult if you're interested in understanding how behaviors are encoded, encoded in the brain. Many of them, have long generation times. Generation time means time between generations. So for flies, it's just a few weeks. For the worms I work with, it's a few days. For us, it's about you know, 20 years. For a spider, it's about one year. So most grad students don't want to work with something which has a one-year generation time. Many are seasonal. So they're only active during the spring and summer. Uh, I would prefer to have one that's active year round. And most orbivores don't actually like to build webs in the lab. Many of, if you look around your house, you rarely see an orb weaver inside your house. They're oftentimes outside. They don't like to be around large mammals like us because out in the wild, large mammals have a tendency to smash through their webs. And when it comes to genetics, um, they're very diverse, which, mean, which makes the genetics difficult. So I started researching species of spiders. I wanted a spider that was not cannibalistic, had a short generation time, wasn't seasonal, had easy access to the brain, that was lab friendly and parthenogenetic means, ideally an organism that can reproduce without sex. And I eventually found a spider that had all of these qualities except the parthenogenetic part. So the species of spider I work with is Euloborus diversus, it's called the hackled orb weaver. They're quite small, they're only four to five millimeters, that's about the size of the end of your thumb, uh, which means we can raise a few hundred of them in a greenhouse at a higher density than if, if they were large. This is a greenhouse where we have and we close in these habitats here. We can also have them in the lab quite easily. So we build these little kind of like apartment buildings for these spiders. They like to build horizontal webs. So we put these little cylinders in here and they build webs on top of them. And then we give them vials of fruit flies and the flies fly around here and they eat them. It's called a little apartment building inside the lab for them. Uh, they have a short generation time, it only takes about three um, months between generations. Many orb weavers need humidity to build their webs, but these particular um, uh, spiders, the Euloborids, can actually build in arid environments. Labs are notoriously dry, and our spiders don't mind building in the lab under dry conditions. And the family um, of the Euloborids, they lack venom glands, which is great because um, they're not very cannibalistic. And since they're not um, on top of their brain, they have easier access to their brain. So the goal of this research um, program in the lab is to robustly define behavior, define the rules of behavior. So we have the algorithm outlined. Then perturb this behavior with chemicals and a variety of genetic tricks to understand how these chemical pathways influence behavior. Then ultimately understand how these chemical pathways operate in the brain. So it's a three-pronged approach we take for this research program. <clears throat> what I'm gonna primarily talk about is the behavior because that was step one. What is the algorithm for building the web? The experimental setup we use is quite simple. We have an uh, infrared camera, an infrared light, and a frame for them to build the web. It's infrared because the spiders wanna build at night. 
And so if we have a light there, they're not gonna build. They build in darkness, but, uh, or darkness to them, even though there's infrared light there. And this is the type of uh, videos we capture. So you can see the spider really well, there's high contrast, and you can see her building her web. We can then write software to track her position in time. Um, this is her position in radial, radial coordinates and her relative orientation. This is fairly straightforward to do. And even though we can't see the web in these videos, we can infer the web structure based on her position since she's constantly laying down lines. So here's an example where um, this, this top trace here is the radial coordinate. Uh, this is her angular coordinate, the second row here. And the third one here is a relative orientation. So if we play this movie, you can see she spends a long time in a proto web stage. She'll do very long pauses. The, uh, this is over several minutes. You can see the time here goes about 200 minutes or a couple of hours. And this is the proto web stage. You can, it's easily defined by just how random the trajectory is. But then eventually, the trajectory becomes very regular at the transition to the radii stage. And then we can define a auxiliary spiral and then the capture spiral. So even though we can't see the actual web during um, this construction, we can easily infer the stage simply based upon the position of the spider. And this spider is following the canonical progression of web building. She went through the protoweb, radii, auxiliary spiral, capture spiral. And then uh, this particular uh, spider at the very end will build something called this development and it's just a little decoration. And she, she goes building a little decoration. But it turns out this paradigm is very flexible. So not all spiders follow this very strict progression of web stages. It's fairly plastic. So I'm gonna to skip to where she starts doing this. Okay, so this spider, I just skipped to the um, uh, part here where she starts building the radii. Um, she pauses, she keeps building her radii. She builds her auxiliary spiral. She starts building her capture spiral. But at a certain point, she decides, you know what? I wanna go back to radii again. She returns to where she left off and then continues the capture spiral. So it shows even at this resolution of behavior, it's an innate behavior, but it's very flexible. It indicates some level of cognitive encoding of this, uh, of this behavior. All right. But we would like to know what she's actually doing with her legs. What are the little behaviors she's performing? So to do this, we took advantage of two recently developed computer algorithms that were developed using uh, neural networks. Neural networks are types of um, computer algorithms um, that are commonly used uh, uh, um, in recent years to build uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, neural networks are used for like, facial recognition or self-driving cars. <clears throat> and the way these networks work is they have sort of a skeletal structure and you teach them something. And once they're taught something, for example, where limb points are, then when you show them movies, they can automatically track where those limb points are because you taught them the rules for, uh, or you, you taught them where the limb points were um, prior in, um, uh, in the past. And so <clears throat> we use these convolutional neural networks in our work. So we'll take a movie that looks like this, where we've tracked the spider and registered all of the frames. So she's in the same orientation. And then we manually annotated points along her leg. <clears throat> so we manually, manually annotated about a few thousand uh, frames. And then we gave these manually annotated frames to the computer and said, okay, based on this knowledge, can you predict the millions upon millions of other frames we have of spider videos? And it turned out it works quite well. So now we converted that movie into a sequence of limb points moving in time. All right. So where can we go from there? So if we track all of these limb points in time, how can we pick up rules of behavior? So behavior is ultimately the movement of points in time, right? So you can think of this as each point 
uh, limb point of the spider moving at different frequencies. So something called a spectrogram, where um, the x axis here is time, the y axis is frequency, and it's highlighted according to which frequencies a certain limb point was using at that point in time. So for example, slow movements have low frequencies, and high movements have fast um, have high frequencies. This is very similar to spectrograms used for vocal recognition. And so we can define each limb at, according to the different frequencies it's moving at. <clears throat> so you can think of this as um, a musician playing different notes in time. Each limb point is moving at different frequencies in time, just like a musician playing different notes in time. And we're not just looking at one position, but many positions of the spider as it builds the web. So that's like many musicians operating together while the spider's building this structure. But these musicians, these limb points aren't moving independently, right? The spider just isn't randomly moving its legs. They're all coordinated. Just like you know, musicians in a band, they aren't playing alone. They're playing in coordination. So you can think of each point in time as a certain piece of music. And like a lot of music, certain notes, certain sequences of notes are repeatedly played over and over again. And the question we want to know is, what are these frequently sampled behaviors, these frequently sampled limb movements that are performed over and over again while the spider is building the web? Mathematically, this is a very high dimensional space. It's very difficult to think in these high dimensions. And so we, call, we use an algorithm called TSNI that basically takes um, high dimensional space and flattens it out into two dimensions. That's analogous to taking a three-dimensional crumpled up piece of paper and spreading it out in two dimensions to see what's written on the paper. And so we do that with this data. And when we project this on the two-dimensional space, we find all these different densities of frequently sampled limb movements. If this was music, these different densities would represent different movements in the music that were frequently sampled over and over again. And so we can apply this to the front legs and the back legs separately. And once we get to these different densities, we can look at them and we can define the different densities in the space um, uh, by these behaviors the spider perform um, uh, is performing. So it turns out these different densities basically represent different behaviors that are easy to um, uh, annotate uh, or to define by eye. So for example, these two densities represented right leg movement, these represent left leg movements, both legs rotating, alternative legs, walking, et cetera. These densities basically represent little sub behaviors. Uh, if this was a ballerina, it might be the movement of one arm or the movement of an other arm. Um, so we can we, then we can ask, okay, well, are these different behaviors sampled the same way in different stages of web building? So we define these stages based upon the position of the spider. And if we look at the different densities that are sampled, different stages of web building use different behaviors. Some behaviors like walking are frequently performed during the proto stage and the radii stage and the auxiliary stage, but rarely performed in the capture stage. Whereas in the capture stage, the sort of fast posterior movement of the legs is frequently sampled and rarely sampled elsewhere. Other behaviors like left legs and right legs are sampled throughout. So if we look at where these behaviors are performed, we can see that certain behaviors like anchoring are only performed in areas where lines cross. So that seems to make sense. Algorithms would be very good at defining um, the behaviors that make sense. Stability momentum behaviors only performed in areas where the spider built stability momentum, et cetera. And so if we watch the position of the spider, while she's building, say, the radii and color code the lines, the color code her trajectory based upon these behaviors, the sequence of behaviors observed makes sense. She performs walking behaviors while she's walking along the lines. She performed turning behaviors when she turned around. So this shows that the algorithm, the, how it's defining behaviors makes sense. Since this makes sense, we can then go and ask, okay, well, what are the rules? What, what's the probability of certain behaviors following others? 
So we can build something called a transition matrix. This represents the rules from, transition, from transitioning from behaviors in the rows here to behaviors in the column. And they're color coded according to the probability you observe that behavior. So for example, here in the auxiliary stage, you're highly likely to, um, uh, the spider's highly likely to perform a, a silk pulling movement, but slow. However, in the capture stage, she's more likely to perform the fast silk pulling movement. So the, it's red here, but cooler here. And then the size of the circle represents the probability of transitioning from the row to the column. For example, if you start with a silk pulling, uh, a slow silk pulling behavior with the left leg movement, you're likely to transition from there to a pure silk pulling movement or a pure left leg movement. So these matrices basically represent the rules from just transitioning from one behavior to another. And this is important because it shows that the rules are different. The structures of the matrices are different at different stages of web building. So if that's the case, we ask, can we go the opposite? So we define the stages of web building based on the position of the spider. And we notice the rules and behaviors are different in different stages of web building. But can we go in the opposite trajectory? Can we ask, based upon just looking at the behaviors without knowing anything about position, can we predict web, the, uh, the web stage? That's like watching a, a ballet you know really well. And, with, and without hearing the music or any of the ballerinas, if you just focus on the primary ballerina, if you know the, the performance really well, you can just look at her and say, ah, yes, based upon those movements, I know it's act two, scene one of you know, Swan Lake. To do this, we use a mathematical formalism called a Harkle Hidden Markov model. And all we ask it to do is say, take all these rules we observed and just assign them to five stages and assign them to the five stages that are most likely to represent what the spider actually performed. What we want to know is, do these five stages give us back the stages of web building? And so here are the um, positions of spiders where we color coded according to how we define web building based on their position. And if we give this to the algorithm, it turns out to be quite good at predicting the different regimes just based upon these micro rules. So it shows that when the spider is in, when it's performing, when it's building the web, that it's transitioning, if we want to build sort of an algorithm here, it's transitioning to, through different motor states and the rules with which it uses to transition, transition through these motor states are encoded by different internal states that influence how it builds the web. So this is one way of defining an algorithm, one way of defining the rules of web building. So we have built these rules. But the spider doesn't build the, the spider doesn't build the web in vacuum. It also takes into account the structure of the web. And so web state also influences the behavior. But as I showed you before in those movies, we couldn't see the web. So recently, we rebuilt the setup. We built a ring of infrared LEDs underneath the frame. And when the light shines at an angle through the silk, it can go up to the camera, just like if you went at night to try to see webs. If you shine your light at an angle, you can see it. And so by constructing it in this way, if we shine the light from the top, we can see the spider. If we shine the light from the sides, we can see the web. So we strobe these lights at very high frame rates to capture leg movements and the structure of the web. And so currently what we're trying to do is since we have these tracked limb movements, we want to ask how do how does the local structure of the web influence the behavior of the spider and build a complete sort of algorithmic model of the web. And then once we have this model, perturb it with different drugs um, and different other sort of means of perturbing the, the rules and ask how do these different perturbations alter the rules of web building? We'd also like to know the underlying genetics. And so just in the last few minutes, I'll show that um, we'd like to perturb it using some genetic tricks. And so um, to that end, one of my students basically assembled the genome of the spider. So we sequenced all the chromosomes. So they have eight autosomes and two um, uh, sex chromosomes. We have 23 autosomes and X and Y chromosomes. And then we, he went through and assembled 
millions upon millions of reads into 10 basic um, chromosomes. So we've been annotating this. So this will provide us with a, um, a, a map or a blueprint of genetic targets we can use to perturb the behavior. We'd also like to know where this is encoded in the brain. So to that end, we've been building a map of their brains. This is a side slice of, this is a basically a CAT scan of a spider's head, essentially. And the orange part here is the brain. The green part is analogous to our spinal column. Now within the brain, we would like to know where different genes are used, different chemical pathways are used. And so um, uh, my postdoc, Greg, has been going through and using a variety of different tools to do this. He's been tagging different genes in the brain and tagging them with dyes so we can see where they are used in the brain. He's also been using antibodies to certain chemical pathways, tagging those with dyes and seeing where those are in the brain. So we can build a physical map of where these pathways are in the brain and then perturb those chemical pathways to ask how they perturb the behavior. We'd also like to see neural activity in a live spider. This is typically very challenging to do. There's been some work recording from the central brain of a spider, but it's challenging because of the venom glands and because of the positive pressure of spiders. Typically when you cut the cuticle, everything spills out. Um, so we're taking an alternative approach where we want, we want to inject dyes into the brain. And these dyes basically are only fluorescent, only glow when neurons are active. So we modified a setup used traditionally with fruit flies where we can glue the spider on, on to a tray, put solution over and cut the, the cuticle and inject these dyes into the brain and then use a microscope to observe these fluorescent flashes in the brain. And so it's taken months to get this to work, but in the end, if we, we can remove the cuticle from a live spider and we have access to her brain. And so now what we want to do is use these chemicals that are only fluorescent when the spider is, is when the neurons are active and monitor the activity of the brain uh, while she's thinking. Ideally, we would do this while she's on a web, but when you do these recordings, she has to be fixed in, in a certain position. So we can't just have her move with the entire microscope. So instead, what we've done is she's fixed and we had her build a web on a styrofoam frame. We then removed her from the web and we put that styrofoam frame on a little air table we built. This air table is analogous to you know, air hockey. There's a lot of little holes here pushing air out and the frame is floating on, on, the, the, this, uh, on this table. And so if we present her to this frame, we can essentially have her perform walking behaviors by moving the frame. That's like you performing walking behaviors on a treadmill. And so the goal is to record her neurons while she's performing behaviors on the brain. All right, so that's basically an overview of the research um, uh, program in my lab with regard to spiders. These are the individuals in my lab who are actually performing the experiments and I'm very thankful to all their hard work. And in just the last few minutes, um, you know, we're surrounded by really amazing organisms that perform really amazing behaviors. And traditionally, it's been very difficult to um, access how these, thing, how, how these behaviors are encoded in the brain. But recently, there's been amazing advances in engineering and molecular and genetic tools to access how these things are performed in a variety of different organisms. So we can move from a very traditional way of observing behavior and use modern approaches to really define behavior as essentially an algorithm encoded by the brain. And so um, I'd like to thank a variety of people at uh, John Hawkins and a variety of other universities who have helped us with this research, uh, funding agencies for funding the work. And thank you to all of you for uh, listening to my talk. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Gordis. Uh, you ready for some questions? Yes. Okay, uh, so we had one question. Uh, do these orb weavers, uh, do only the females make webs or do male orb weavers make webs also? That's a fantastic question. So juvenile females and males build these orb webs, but when the males reach sexual maturity, they stop building orb webs. They'll build maybe a minimal web, but that's about it. 
um, they use other female webs for capturing their prey. And they spend a lot of time um, really focused on trying to find a mate. So they stop building orb webs once they reach maturity. And uh, is the composition of the web material different at the different stages of construction? That is correct, yes. So um, the different stages of web building are a different, uh, different uh, silk proteins are used for different stages. So the strongest silk that's used is used in the radii, in, uh, for the radii and the, uh, the, the frame. That's the load bearing part of the web. The uh, thicky spiral is the sort of weakest uh, silk thread, but it's the stickiest. Uh, and so for to capture prey, they typically have to hit one of the radii, but then they get entangled in the capture spiral. Um, and different silk proteins are used for anchoring lines and, uh, and the stibulomentum and egg sac as well. They actually have different glands that are devoted for making these different compositions. So what happens to the auxiliary spiral material that gets removed? Is that reused somehow? No, she typically consumes it. Yeah, they, they often consume uh, the silk if they're, um, uh, that's taken down, or sometimes if it's a lot, she'll just ball it up and just drop it. What's the purpose of the uh, stabilimentum that some spiders will build in the center of the webs? That's a good question. That's kind of a, a matter of debate. It's called the stabilimentum because early on, people thought that it stabilized the web, but it provides no structural real support or advantage to the web. One hypothesis is that it helps camouflage the spider. So our spiders often hide underneath the stabilimentum so she can't be seen. Another proposal is that it helps deter uh, uh, birds from flying through it, kind of like when you put bird silhouettes on glass. If you put a little structure there, it prevent, it'll prevent a large bird from flying through it, but flies and stuff are small enough that if they avoid it, they get caught in the web. Do male or weavers survive beyond the time they mate, or do they kind of die shortly thereafter? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, as I mentioned, they need to have some other webs available to them if they want to capture prey. So if we put a male spider on a previously built web and put flies on there, he'll, he'll gladly eat those flies. So they survive off you know, the, the, uh, the work of others. Um, I mentioned this species is, they're considered pseudo-social. Pseudo-social for a spider means they don't frequently eat each other. Most spiders are cannibalistic. And so frequently in our habitats, we'll see dead females However, we never find dead males. So they're capable of being around other females and we'll put males with females so that he can mate with a couple, but eventually he disappears. So eventually I think he gets eaten. Uh, so how are you able to administer the drugs to the spiders? That's a great question. So um, we, built an entire setup for holding on to them gently. Um, and it's typically used, so this setup here, um, there's a variety of gizmos here, but basically we use a little suction device to hold on to their abdomen. And there's a little, called a peltier here, it's a little cooling block. And we, we use that to anesthetize them. So if we take them down cold enough, they'll slow down. And then we can just administer little drops to their, to their mouth, essentially. And if we mix the drugs with sugar, they'll just suck it right up. So we, we can orally administer the drugs. Alternatively, we, alternatively we've also tried injecting them. Um, and that also works, though it's a little more invasive. So for the drugs, we prefer to give it orally because it's less invasive and less dangerous. But for some of the genetic tricks we use, we, we inject them. Uh, do you know of any applications for your research in something like robotics or neural network design or something like that? That's a good question. So there's a lot of work in AI in trying to build flexible algorithms, algorithms that can that are trained to do something, but can do a lot of error correction and error assessment. And um, that's part of one of the many reasons why I'm interested in behavioral research 
with regard to trying to understand how these things are encoded in the brain, because I'm interested in the underlying algorithms used for behaviors, and if these algorithms can inform how to uh, build similar algorithms uh, you know, in silica or with, with, with computers. Nature has evolved amazing, amazing computational abilities and very small um, hardware, and uh, it's impressive, and I would like to know how that works. So uh, how much of a setback for the spider is it when I inadvertently walk through a web in the middle of the day? Spiders typically don't get captured in their own webs. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why. So, um, so they're, they're kind of hairy. Um, you can't really see it there, I guess. But typically, if uh, the this, this silk will just, it touches the, the tips of the hair, so it, it, the capture spiral um, only touches a very small surface area. But also the chemical composition of the cuticle is different. So um, they have evolved. So the capture spiral, uh, it, insects have very waxy cuticle and spider webs are very good at sticking to that waxy cuticle, but not as good at, uh, at sticking to spiders. So we can take our spiders and kind of like wrap them up in their silk and they'll just get out of it. So do you have any data about how the effectiveness of the web uh, is affected when the spider is under the influence of the drugs or the other factors used in your experiments? Well, we assume the effectiveness goes down um, in field research, not, not my work, but others. Um, web regularity is important for capturing prey. So if you have massive holes in your web, it'll be less effective at capturing prey because prey can you know, zoom right through that. It's all a matter of probability. Do you have a nice sort of uniform web that'll capture prey anywhere? One interesting drug, uh, which we are eager to test, but the experiments haven't been done yet, is LSD. So according to Peter Witt, LSD was the only drug he gave that actually improved the geometry of the web. So the spiders built more regular webs when they were giving micro doses of LSD. If you give a, hallucinog a hallucinogenic dose of LSD, the spider doesn't do anything. It just kind of sits there. Um, so we're very curious to know if we can reproduce this result. And if so, why is the web more regular? Is it because the spider's behavior has greater behavioral fidelity? It's just very precise and performs very few errors? Or is it just better at going back and fixing errors? We would really like to know. Um, humans who microdose on LSD uh, will say they feel more lucid. So if you microdose, you don't hallucinate, but humans claim they're, they're more lucid and sort of plugged in. Though it's controversial because if you give them certain tasks to perform, they typically don't perform them any better than someone who's not on LSD, uh, but they seem to be very focused on the task. So perhaps spiders are more focused when they're microdosed with LSD. How long does it take after a spider basically comes out of the egg until they have the ability to build a web? Um, so they can build webs uh, right when they hatch. Typically, the very first, hash first hatchlings that come out, they build a web that's not really quite an orb web. Um, but once they molt, they build a classic orb web. Um, so, uh, so yeah, they, they're born with a motivation to build orb webs. And it doesn't require observing other spiders. We can isolate the spiders after hatching and they'll, they'll build orb webs. Okay, so it looks like we've worked our way through all the questions that we have in the chat. We had quite a stack of them. Thank you, Dr. Gordis. Uh, so we'll go ahead and bring it to a close for today. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew Gordis, for being here with us today, helping us discover more about our world. Uh, so please join us on Wednesday, January 5th at noon uh, for This Is Not a New Year's Resolution, presented by Dr. Serena Kajani. Uh, she is a scientist at AstraZeneca, and she's going to be talking about basically uh, your microbiome and how your diet can affect your microbiome and how that can in turn affect your health. Uh, so you can register at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend. It is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today and stay safe and stay curious. Mm -hmm.